Good evening, everyone. Why? We have a very special um, evening tonight. Um, the town of Kent was contacted by the military order of the Purple Heart and asked to become a Purple Heart town, a, a distinction that we gladly um, and proudly accepted. And so tonight is the night that we are going to um, present our proclamation declaring the town of Kent a Purple Heart town. And um, I'm, I'm not gonna you know, belabor the point, but actually before I read the proclamation, I, I just happened upon a uh, quote by uh, Douglas MacArthur that I thought was apropos of, this, of, of the military order of the Purple Heart. The soldier, above all others, prays for peace, for it is the soldier who must suffer and bear the deepest wounds and scars of war. And that's who we honor tonight those men and women who bear those deep scars or who lost their lives in defense of our country. And so, with, without further ado, I'd like to read the proclamation. Whereas the Purple Heart is awarded to men and women in the United States military who have been wounded or killed in combat by enemy forces while defending the United States of America, and whereas the town board of the town of Kent, as well as the residents of the town of Kent, have great admiration and the utmost respect and gratitude for all the men and women who have selflessly served their country and this community in the armed forces. And whereas the town board of the town of Kent salutes all the brave men and women who paid the high price of freedom by leaving their families, friends, and communities and placing themselves in harm's way for the good and protection of all Americans. And whereas the town board of the town of Kent acknowledges the heroic contributions and sacrifices of these men and women in the military because they are the foundation in maintaining the freedoms and way of life for all Americans. And whereas the town board of the town of Kent recognizes and appreciates the sacrifices town of Kent residents who are Purple Heart recipients made in defending our freedoms while serving in the armed forces and believe it is important that we honor them for their courage and commend them for their acts of bravery. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the town board of the town of Kent hereby proclaims the town of Kent as a Purple Heart town and recognizes the dedication and sacrifices of all men and women in the United States military, wounded or killed, serving to protect the freedoms enjoyed by all Americans, and encourages its residents to show them the honor, respect, and support they have earned by their courageous acts. Maureen Fleming, Supervisor, April 21st, 2015. Um, I'd like now to present this and to bring to the podium Eugene Lang, the junior, junior, the senior vice commander, and Neil Gross, the commander of the Military Order of the Purple Heart, Chapter 21. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. My wife always tells me, okay, my best uh, speeches or best talks have been those that I write down and memorize, okay? Um, she happens to be absolutely correct, except in this one occasion, okay? Um, I'm so proud to be here tonight with the members, people from Kent, people from Putnam County. I grew up in Putnam Valley, by the way, so I'm a neighbor, okay? Uh, I know for a fact uh, that the county of Putnam, Putnam itself is a very patriotic uh, county filled with loads of loyal and patriotic members. And I want to tell you right now uh, that uh, I will not forget tonight. I won't forget all that's been done for, for the members of my chapter, the uh, Military Order of the Purple Heart. I do want to also remind everyone here 
that if you go to the VA hospitals today, you will not see as many people my age anymore, okay? What you're gonna see in most of those units and most of those PTSD units and most of the hospital now are young people, Iraqi vets, Afghani vets coming in for treatment. And those are the people that we serve. Those are the people that we admire. Those are the people that we will make sure get the service they need. And please don't forget the number 22. On the average, 22 active duty and retired and, and, and non-active duty servicemen give their lives up or lose their lives because they're unhappy, they're either unemployed, or, they're, or they've reached a state of hopelessness and they commit suicide. That has got to be our mission. Our mission has got to be to stem that tide and present a new world, okay, where they can live and feel proud to be of, of service to this country instead of being a, uh, they have the feeling of hopelessness that, hopelessness that they have now. So that's one thing that our chapter will never give up, and that is supporting our, our troops that are now in the hospitals, the VA hospitals in Montrose, at Castle Point, and in the, and, uh, in the Bronx. Thank you. Hi. I always love to follow Neil. He covers everything. I only have a few words to say. When I go to the meetings by myself, where I do accept the proclamation by myself and Neil is not there, then I'm in trouble. <laughs> no, it's not true. <laughs> then I actually do have to give a speech. But with just a few words, what the military or the Purple Heart, we, what we do for the veterans in Montrose. Uh, we have towns that set up uh, boxes for us where they collect clothes, because there is quite a few uh, veterans that are in need, that can't afford to go out and buy new clothes. Montrose does have a place where they just go in, they just have to show their ID, no proof of income or anything like that, and they give them clothes. Also, there's a food pantry there, and we have been approached for diapers, baby diapers, <laughs> and also baby formula. And we've had some people that were very generous and we have taken it to Montrose. And we do like to support the veterans. We also do barbecues there for the veterans too. And they appreciate it. Matter of fact, one time I took my wife with us and she started crying. <laughs> I mean, it's very heartfelt. You know, you really feel it when the guys come over and they come to you and they say, you know, we really want to thank you for everything that you guys have done. And we do the barbecue, and we start crying a little bit. I blame the smoke. <laughs> but we would like to thank the town thank you for the proclamation and the supervisor and everybody else. So, thank you. guests in the audience um, this evening, and before we get to giving out um, additional proclamations, I would like to introduce our county executive, Mary Ellen O'Dell, who was the impetus basically for having Putnam County become the first Purple Heart County in New York State, and so I think we should thank Mary Ellen and we invite her. Well, I'll take credit because I take blame, so I'll take the credit when credit is good. And, uh, but I will share that tonight I do have a heavy heart, and I know many of us do, as we acknowledge and remember and uh, say thank you to those uh, Purple Heart recipients, our good friend, our dear friend, Dennis Castelli, who it was Sunday, we uh, marked the first year anniversary of Dennis's passing, and we all know what contributions Dennis made to our veteran community for sure, but also to our historic integrity as well. Dennis was a true patriot. He could always make everyone not only feel proud to be an American, but certainly proud to be a Putnam County resident, and uh, so I'd like to honor Dennis and, and his memory this evening. 
And uh, to Supervisor Fleming, I just want to say your, your administration is uh, definitely one that our administration is very proud to work with. Your administration and what you represent in the town of Kent with your esteemed colleagues here on the town board has definitely uh, developed, we've definitely developed a strong partnership and I want to thank you very much for that opportunity. And to our veterans, to those of you who served, for those of you who served with honor in all conflicts, but most notably the Vietnam conference, we always say, welcome home. And we say in Putnam County this year, we're honored to have the moving wall for the third time here we've hosted in Putnam County. That will be in the last weekends of September. And uh, at the same time, we're going to acknowledge the Gold Star Mothers Memorial celebration, which is traditionally the last Sunday in September. So while we honor tonight and we remember the year 2015 for Putnam County is the year of the family, our veterans certainly are our family. Without you, our families obviously would not be able to enjoy the company and love of each other. And so it's with great honor that I read to you um, the proclamation that we've prepared. I see Supervisor Schmidt, how wonderful of you, from the town of Carmel, who actually took the honor of uh, making Carmel the first town at Purple Heart here. Um, on behalf of legislators Tony Adonisio and legislator Carl Abano, I'll share with you the words of the proclamation. Whereas the Purple Heart is the oldest military decoration in use today and was created as the badge of military merit by General George Washington in 1782. And whereas the Purple Heart is awarded to any member of the United States Armed Forces who was wounded or killed in combat with a declared enemy of the United States of America. And whereas the mission of the Military Order of the Purple Heart, chartered by an act of Congress, is to foster an environment of goodwill among combat wounded veterans and their families, to promote patriotism and to support legislative initiatives, and most importantly, to make sure that we never forget. And whereas Putnam County, while small in size, has from its very origins in 1812, provided military leaders of national and historical significance. Named for General Israel Putnam, an American Revolutionary War hero, Putnam County had four fighting generals in the Civil War, including General Daniel A. Butterfield, who is credited with composing TAPS, and five Cong Congressional Medal of Honor recipients, recipients, excuse me, Abraham K. Arnold, Samuel N. Benjamin, w William J. Brewer, Daniel A. Butterfield, and John McCloy. And whereas Putnam County was, in fact, New York State's first Purple Heart County, and whereas the town of Kent, as a municipality within Putnam County, greatly appreciates and recognizes the commitment and sacrifices made by our military service members and their families, including our Gold Star and Blue Star mothers, and we pledge to continue and to honor and to support their contributions. Whereas April 21st, 2015 has officially been designated as the day in the town of Kent to remember and recognize our veterans who are recipients of the Purple Heart. Therefore, now let it be proclaimed that town of Kent will hereby be recognized as a Purple Heart town. Thank you very much. Do a little PSA here. It's called a public service announcement. We have so many acronyms. The Row of Honor, Putnam County's Row of Honor, is a celebration. It's a, it's a living, moving celebration that we host two times in the hamlet of Carmel, which is the county seat. And on the shores of Lake Lanida, I think many of you have noticed that we display 100 American made flags. Each one is in honor of a veteran or a first responder, or just a true American patriot. If you'd like to honor someone's memory by having a, a flag displayed on the shores of Lake Lanida, you can certainly um, just take a look at our website and find the information there. It's really become a tourist destination in a strange but beautiful way. 
and we're very, very proud here in, in Putnam County, the heart of the Hudson Valley, that we remember and honor not only on Memorial Day, but on Veterans Day. And it should be noted, you can leave the flag with us and we return it back for display, or you can take it home and display it in your own, in your own home or your own property or, or gift it. So uh, thank you again, Supervisor, and my colleagues on the town of Kent Ward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a lot of very distinguished guests in the audience tonight, and I would like to present to each of them a copy of the proclamation that we read um, earlier today designating the town of Kent as a Purple Heart town. So I'd like to bring up um, Carl Rohde, the director of the Putnam County Veterans Services Agency. She asked me if I'd like to say a couple of words. <laughs> um, Mary Ellen mentioned it that in 1812, we're named, you know, start, at the start of the War of 1812, we became a county, General Putnam. If you notice on uh, the this, this symbol, is Sybil Ludington of the town of Kent, who was part of the Revolutionary War, um, helped call out the troops, which is very important. So this, this county has a lot of um, military history. Also, Mary Ellen very modestly didn't mention that she's one of our honorary veterans, Putnam County Joint Veterans Council, named her that a few years ago. Um, we don't, we don't do it very often, but we do name people uh, honorary veterans. But I want to touch on one thing that I wasn't going to talk about because Neil brought it up, I think it's important, that's the, the suicide rate. The suicide rate amongst veterans, I know this doesn't necessarily fit in with what we're talking about, but is, is, is almost at an epidemic proportion. And what I'd like to offer to the town of Kent, if they would like to sponsor one, uh, we have three of us in the, in the um, Veterans Service Agency that are trained Safe Talk instructors. Safe Talk is a way to instruct, it's a half a day class to instruct you not to necessarily intervene, but to be able to recognize, not just for service members, but for anybody who might be considering suicide so that you can get them some help. So uh, the um, town of Kent, we, uh, you know, it, it's, it's we know the cost of the town, uh, we, one morning or one afternoon, we'd love to come up here and, and, and give that. We need about 10 or 15 participants. I'll get the information to you, but this is, this is very important. We have had two veterans in the last two years commit suicide in our county. Um, one was too many. So I thank you for this. This, this is just great that uh, the second town, we're down there with um, Supervisor um, Schmidt, and now my town does it. We should have moved a little faster. <laughs> I'd like to present a certificate to um, Dale Cusack, Vice Chairman of the Putnam County Joint Veterans Council. Dale has opted not to say <laughs> Next, I'd like to bring up um, Rocky Calavito, the commander of the American Legion Post 270. Rocky. Rocky's never been known to not say I've a never. couple words. <laughs> but quickly, I'm just very proud to and honored to accept this for the Mont Post 270 American Legion, and uh, I thank everyone. Next, I'd like to call up Gabriel Ocasio, the commander of the VFW Post 1374. Dwight Keith to accept it on behalf of the Putnam County Marine Corps League. And I'd also like to call up Irene Rohde, 
who's the president of the New York State VFW Ladies Auxiliary. On behalf of the VFW Ladies Auxiliary um, Department of New York, I'm going to say I'm very honored and I congratulate the town of Kent be becoming a um, Purple Heart town. Um, I want to thank all the veterans here for your sacrifice so I can enjoy my freedoms today and travel around. Thank you very much. Well, that pretty much concludes the ceremony. I would just, again, like to thank the Military Order of the Purple Heart for giving Kent this honor and to thank all the men and women in the audience for their service and certainly to thank all the Purple Heart recipients for their service above and beyond. So thank you very much. minute break just to uh, pre-set up. Thank you. That was a lovely ceremony. And now we're going to get on to the rest of our agenda. But before we do, I was asked um, to mention that there is a pancake breakfast at 9 a.m. on May 16th at the Carmel VFW. It's $8 a ticket. And the proceeds from that go toward the row of honor. Um, that the, chief, uh, the county executive mentioned and the moving wall, which will be coming in September. So again, that's at the Carmel VFW. We'll announce it again at the, um, at the next meeting, but May 16th. Okay, the first, the second item on the workshop agenda is budget transfers. And I ask our Director of Finance, Michelle Summer, to come up. Hi, good evening. Um, before I just went into the budget transfers, I just wanted to do a quick recap of where we are for the first quarter of 2015. Um, I sent you guys a copy of the report, but I just kind of wanted to summarize where we were. The um, overall picture is looking very good for the first quarter. Our, in terms of our tax re receipts, we were, they were collected efficiently by the tax receiver. All of the tax money was in by February 5th, all 15 million plus. And then we were able to pay out our contractual obligations to the two fire districts in the library. Uh, we've already seen some savings compared to budget in workers' comp insurance, uh, about 34000 over the four um, funds that that affects, which is highway, general fund, Lake Carmel, and sanitation. So really, on, we're on track. The only issues that I want to talk about um, are really to do with the snow and to highway, and that's where the, then we lead into the budget transfers. But everything else is on budget or under budget or in, you know, anticipate doing well for the quarter. Excellent. I don't know if anybody had any specific questions about the first quarter. Mm -hmm. OK. So we'll move to the budget transfers. I emailed those to you so you'd have a chance to really look at them. The first one I wanted to go through was the general fund. Um, our chief of police, Alex, just had a small request. He had received two checks for in the amount of almost $2,800. He wanted to increase his revenue line and then also increase his, increase his schools line, which is his training line, because he anticipated some extra expenses there. And then we had also gone over just a little bit in the good and welfare, so to cover those two. Uh, the other area in the general fund where we were overexpensed was in the <coughs> clearing of the town hall with the snow that we had and the number of storms that we had. We had a significant amount of overtime over what we had budgeted. So in order to cover those expenses, as I had mentioned earlier, we had savings in the workers' compensation insurance. So knowing that we have those as our final numbers, I felt that it was probably the cleanest and easiest just to transfer the money from there to cover it because this is... It was a necessary um, expenditure for the town. So that's where the uh, changes are being pulled and also is also being pulled from parks personnel services because the parks employees are the ones who are working on the compound or the complex. And so when they're working during their regular day, 
they were working here rather than in parks, so there was a savings to parks, and so therefore I moved some of the money from parks into the town center to cover that. It's just really a reallocation within the general fund, not, an, you know, not anything different. So any questions on the general fund transfers? Was that a significant variance as far as the, uh, the money that um, park workers would have gotten paid through their park budget versus the highway, you know, the snow. I just transferred about $2,000. Okay. It wasn't much. It was, a, you know, there were a number of days where it was during the regular work week when they okay. were here, so helping out. Okay. Yeah. So on the highway fund, um, we have on the easiest part first is the increase to revenue for insurance recoveries. Unfortunately, we had a number of accidents, and so there was $11,334, um, and that money is to be used directly to auto repair, where um, the municipal garage and Nick will be fixing those. So we wanted to increase the revenue and also increase the expense. The other part was, as you know, as we all noticed, there was a lot of storms. So where we had the major expenses was in overtime. Whenever the employees are working outside of 7 o'clock to 3.30, Monday through Friday, we encounter overtime. And if they're called in at, you know, at night, there's a call in. There's a lot of expenses related to that. So, um, and then there was also expenses um, to do with more salt and sand. So, and then repairs on machines because our machines were breaking down as we were repairing the roads. So overall, I was having increase to the overtime for snow budget of 135,000. This not only covers the expenses we did incur, but it's also giving us a $30,000 cushion for November and December of 2015 as we you know, have not yet finished the year and we still need to anticipate that there will be some weather events in those months. On the snow removal contractual, we increased that budget by 83,000 leaving about 28,000 for snow and salt um, for the, the fall. And then the auto repair, there was auto repair directly related to the, to the storm with uh, the sanders and the plows, not necessarily of the machinery, but of the equipment going down of 72,000. So we put funding a line just for snow repair, removal, auto repair, and then the um, payroll taxes related to those expenses. So overall, the increase in the what I was proposing here and after speaking with the highway department and municipal repairs, we felt like the best or the, the solution that would work the best was to increase uh, the town's use of fund balance by 300,000 in order to offset the expenses for the winter. This would then leave Rich's budget intact for all the things that he still needs to do for the year, including you know, the summer repair of the roads, as well as buying an equipment for the aging fleet. And it really just sort of segments the winter as the winter, and that's complete and final, and then he can work within his budget going forward. I don't know if anybody had any questions related to the highway transfer. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the last one is, oh, sorry, did you? The, the additional money for November and December snow removal over time and contractual. If we don't use that, that goes back into the fund balance? That's correct. Yep. Um, so the last transfer is a small one. This is just for Lake Carmel for disability insurance in the budgeting process. I left that out, so I was just moving $250 from the workers' compensation to the disability insurance to cover those expenses for the year. So these are really the first quarter transfers, there's really nothing major except for obviously <laughs> 300,000 yeah, from the highway. But um, I think it's pretty much explained by. How much of a tax increase would that have been? Um, I, I'd say about 3% probably as a rough guess. My only concern is that if we do it now, which I'm inclined to do, but if we do it now and leave the rest of the highway to put budget intact, there's really no incentive to save in the highway budget. The highway budget goes on like this $300,000 winter never happened, where if we wait um, you know, to transfer it at a later time, at least there's some incentive to continue to save knowing that, hey, uh, you know, we had a bad winter and that means you know, some things that aren't necessary may need to get 
you know, took a harder look at come September, August, or October when we're making these decisions. But I don't know if there's an accounting reason why we wouldn't want to do that. Well, the accounting reason is you're really not allowed to have funds that are not funded. So we would have to transfer from somewhere else. And the only other place that I would anticipate we could do that from is the equipment budget. But as the next item on the agenda is, we're looking to buy the equipment that Rich needs in order to fulfill next year's obligations because of the time lag on ordering equipment. So that, and also we have, so I, I really, I do understand your concerns, but then that's the only other solution that I have that then impedes him going forward. So this is incumbent on us as a board, <coughs> yourself and the highway department to just kind of keep in mind that although we have our full budget there, we have to remember we took a large chunk out and that, you know, Absolutely. should be considered with discretionary purchases going forward. Because if we can save 50000 even though we're budgeted for it, we're really not budgeted for it in the general scheme of things. Yeah, so when I say like a, when you're saying like a full budget, it's sort of putting them back to where they, it, I don't know that there's like an extra pool of money per se, it's just sort of basically, I mean, Like having, the winter didn't happen. Yeah, but having like $30,000 in overtime for November and December is very limiting anyway. So I think that we haven't put in a lot for the winter, and really we do segment the budget between winter and summer. So the summer is the same as it was and as planned. So now that the winter's sort of over, we, you know, we do have a limited amount for next winter. And actually, um, a lot of my discussions today, we've had a number of conversations and we meet on a monthly basis, but it's really been cost containment. You know, really, this is, you know, we're going to have to make sure we can live within our budget. And, they make savings along the way. Mm -hmm. um, if, if we do take this 300000 at a fund balance, that's going to leave a fund balance prior to any other spending outside of the budget of? Um, including the amount, so it leave it at $1.2 million. $1.2 million, that's after paying for the salt shed? Yes. Yeah. That's with the um, expenses for, or the budgeted expenses for FY15. So and it's about. That's not going to the well for any of the equipment that's coming up next. No, because the equipment that's coming up next is in the budget currently. So that's already been included in that number. So when, at the end of this budget transfer, there'd be 1.2 uh, million, which is 34% of the annual budget. So it's still within a healthy margin of what the. Well, when you say a healthy margin, we started at 13, right. at 2.1, at 15, we're 1.2. Right. No, we, I, we took a big chunk out of a healthy margin. We in, certainly in, have, in, but in a I short period of time. But I know that Rich would say, and probably others, you know, we have been using it mainly for things like, I mean, the salt shed is 200,000. You've got equipment this year we're buying. Oh no, I'm, I'm, I don't disagree you know, with that. Yeah. I, I think it's well invested. I mean, I think the town was. Why didn't we have a salt shed 40 years ago? I, sure. mean, mm -hmm. uh, I, I agree with that uh, wholeheartedly. I think it's a wise investment. Yeah. You know, it's a no-brainer. But it certainly does mean that going forward, we have to be careful because, like this year, well, you know, we're using fund balance accounts. Well, I know, but <laughs> not <laughs> we, us. I mean, we as a town, including. But um, I have a question. Sure. Um, even though it's predicted that we're not going to have a 